It's going to be dope. We see the man with the master plan, Mr. Edward Scissorhand, has entered the chat. What's going on? We are here cooking with grease. Good to see everybody. Welcome, welcome. All right, so you know how we do, you know how this thing goes. Uh, first and foremost, again, welcome everybody. Want to make sure everybody is getting the full experience here because it really doesn't make much sense. I mean, let me hook my guy up real quick, make him co host and everything, spotlight, so everybody can see them beautiful eyes that Ed has. He has amazing eyes. So we want to really get this thing started uh, in the best way, the only way to be able to do so and make sure that you guys are leveraging. It's a word that I love to use. I love to uh, be able to take advantage of that. And it is important to do so. So if you're here and you're not leveraging, um, you are wasting your time. Uh, you will accomplish your goals, but you would do it in the most painful, slowest way possible. So first things first, uh, if you go to your screen and you go to the, the picture of yourself, if you have a picture up or if you just have your name, go there, click on the top right hand corner, you'll see three dots. You want to click on those three dots and hit rename at the bottom. When you get here, you want to put your name, you want to put your contact, I'd say phone number, and then you want to put what state that you are in. So if you see mine right now, it says Eddie Charger, it says my phone number, and then it says Georgia. And why is this important? Well, for example, let's say Will is in a market that I have a deal in. And now because I know Will is in Chattanooga, I can send it over to him, right? I can get a hold of his IG. I know exactly how to be able to do that because he's giving me the information that I need, right? And then I want you guys to look in the chat. My guy, Cody, has already led the way with exactly what you should be doing in the chat. Now, you guys know I have a rule of three. There are three things you should be doing whenever you're making contact or communication with anybody or anything. Uh, and that should be first, how do we get into contact with you, right? So you put your name, email, phone number, et cetera, et cetera. Then you got to put, you know, what is your superpower? So for me, for example, my superpower uh, is I'm a problem solver. Uh, I'm also a capital raiser. I'm a connector. So I put that down and then I put what I'm looking for. Okay. I am looking for uh, short term rentals, mid term rentals, I'm looking for affordable housing. I am looking for multifamily. And here's the markets that I'm looking for multifamily deals in. Uh, and how that work. All right. So if you guys are not doing that, you're missing out on a great opportunity to network with the people that are here. I think Michelle in the house. What's up? Shout out to my sub two family. Uh, I've seen a lot of good people in here. This is pretty cool. Pretty cool. All right. So we'll get started. Ed, man, how's it going? How's the evening going for you? What up, everyone? Uh, good. Uh, got a little busy, but we're we're here. Uh, favorite day of the week, hanging out with you guys. Uh, how about you? How's your day going? Day's going well, man. You know, I'm getting to the point where I stopped complaining about it not being uh more than 24 hours in the day. So that's a, I think that's a good sign of a uh, you know, I think there's like signs of an addicted entrepreneur, right? Like if, you, if you're an entrepreneur and you, how do you know you have a problem? is when you start trying to figure out how do we get more than 24 hours in the day, right? I, I think that the first the first <laughs> sign of uh, admitting you have a problem is when you can say, well, let me just figure out how to make the 24 actually work, right? I see John smiling. He's like, yeah, that's I'm in that same struggle with the group. But I mean, it's, it's the gift and curse, man. I tell people all the time, when you're an entrepreneur, it's great. Uh, but you got your own set of, uh, ben, you know, problems and your own set of benefits that, that work, but that's what makes an entrepreneur so great, right? That's what makes you, uh, part of the crazies. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that. That's a, a, a ad that Apple did and they talked about the crazies, the crazy ones, uh, probably one of my favorite ads. 
and Daphne is a shout out to all of you guys. So don't get upset at me. I didn't call you crazy. Steve Jobs did, right? And uh, he's dead, so you can't do nothing about it, okay? So we're going to jump into it. Um, I do want to kind of showcase first a little bit about our ecosystem. If you guys are here and you understand, you are here by way of um, the multifamily freedom chasers. You see it in our backgrounds right here. Uh, an amazing community of individuals who all have one common goal. That is to own and operate multifamily assets that bring in the type of money that retire you from your nine to five job. And I don't know if that just sounded good or not, but is there anyone here that would love to be able to look up 18 months from now, 24 months from now, and that be a reality for them? That you get to retire solely off of the capital, the passive income that's coming in from your multifamily. The best part about it is it's running itself, right? So it's not you getting a call at 3 a.m. to go unclog toilets and et cetera, et cetera. It's your team, your business, and et cetera. Jocko, what's going on, man? Uh, and so that's what it's about. That's exactly what we do. And, and we typically go through a week of information. So this past week, uh, we, we spoke with an amazing human being who gave us more insight on uh, being able to raise capital through IRA, right? Uh, 401ks and, and et cetera. Uh, that was amazing. If you missed that, you if you're on the email thread, you'll be able to get it. The replay, if not, you also can go to YouTube to be able to catch the replay of that. Uh, and then on Monday, we do broker calls. And that is basically uh, the man, the myth, the legend himself, Mr. Billionaire P. He comes on. I'm normally on there with him as well. And we live call brokers right then and there. Okay, that's done at 2 p.m. Uh, we call brokers. We reach out to them for two main objectives. Their first is to find out about a deal. And honestly, we use that as an excuse. Okay, our main objective is to build relationships with brokers. Um, why do we build relationships with brokers? Ed, could you tell with could you share with the good people why we would build a relationship with a broker? Why is that important? I know Peter just came on, so I'm gonna bring Peter up as well, but I definitely want to hear from you uh, because Ed does a lot of underwriting. Um, and that's me being modest, right? Like he does more than a lot of underwriting. Uh, I actually think he, he has a, a problem, but we don't want to we don't want to bring it up in this format. We want to, you know, get a small circle of family and friends. And but that's a different thing, right? So, Ed, tell us why is it important to build relationships with brokers as um, as we're getting started here? Yeah, there's no AA for underwriting, unfortunately, but um. Uh, so the broker is going to be your second best friend in this business. Your first is going to be the lender. The first is going to be the broker. Now, I'll get to the lender after, but the why the broker is your best friend or second best friend is because imagine this. If you can have someone in the market you're looking to purchase in do the legwork for you without you having to do it yourself and spend the time for it, why wouldn't you? You're essentially creating an army. I've always, this is how um, investing in real estate, it, I always envision in my head. You're the soldier, whether it's your team or, or you're the, sorry, you're the captain, you're in charge, whether it's you or your team or your partners. The more people you have out there looking for deals for you, more people you have out there that are keeping you top of mind and know what you're looking for and are going to bring those things back to you, the, the, more resources you're going to have than the other people that are trying to do the same thing. Um, for example, I'm an agent out here in California. Unfortunately, I don't buy in California, but if I was going to, I'm going to have an advantage over majority of people here because you don't live in California in LA specifically. So I'm always going to have more deals sent to me than anyone else will because I'm, I'm friends with these agents. I run into them at different um, places and whatnot. Um, 
and it's like that anywhere. You don't have to live in the same city. Um, I know a lot of agent people in Ohio because of a mentorship I'm a part of. I have people who, if I say I want to buy an Ohio area, people are going to send me deals, and I know people I can go to that I can rely on. So it's all about being your net, building your network, building people you trust, and pe- building a team around you that's going to do the legwork for you so you can do what you're good at and the money-making activities. Not everyone's superpower is acquisitions, but if you have a very good broker, multiple brokers in a city, they're going to do it for you. You just have to do, make sure your T's are crossed and I's are dotted. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's absolutely true. Uh, Peter, are you able to speak? I know you you, you didn't get your camera on, so I'm, I'm wondering if you're not available or not. I can speak. Awesome, awesome. Peter, so uh, you heard what Ed said about it. Could you tell or share with the good people, you know, um, what's the broker call been like for you and how that's been impacting your business and your growth uh, as you get started in, in multifamily? Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's more of what Ed said, right? It, the, the key is you need as many people out there finding deals as possible. The more brokers you can connect with, the more brokers you can develop that relationship with, the more people you have out there farming deals for you. Um, And they do do, you know, uh, they do a ton of work for you that you don't have to. Now, you're going to pay for that, but again, that's okay as long as you're getting value. And they're bringing you good value and good deals. And when you form those relationships, you can definitely get good value out of that. But the calls, uh, the Zoom calls have been amazing because, number one, it forces me to carve out that time to do it, right? And to see other people responding that it's encouraged them to do the same that's what it's all about, encouraging right. other people to do it. So um, it's been been amazing, and I love the fact that people keep coming back, and then they come to the the underwriting and come to the debt calls and just keep learning. That's it. That's what it's Good about. It's put, putting in that repeated action, right, and, and being able to um, be consistent. You know, I think one of the most important things you just mentioned, it, it's about – um, being able to carve out the time that it takes. And that's what we're doing on Tuesdays. And that's what we're doing, uh, sorry, that's what we're doing Mondays at 2 p.m. But that's also what we're doing right now, right? We are carving out the time. I'm almost positive there are other things that you guys could have chose to do uh, as opposed to being on here with, you know, two ads, right? Uh, and, and and talking multifamily and all that sort of stuff. But it's because, you have a bigger goal, a bigger dream, uh, and I'm super, super excited for you guys, and we're, we're going to dive in. We're going to help you guys out. So, again, this is the community. This is the ecosystem. You have Sunday, the activation Zoom, at 8.30 p.m. Monday, 2 p.m., we get straight into it, talking to brokers and connecting with them. And then you have tonight, Tuesdays, at 8 p.m., we go into underwriting, napkin underwriting. Now, we have a back-and-forth type of system that happens on Wednesday. So what happens on Wednesdays is one week we will be doing advanced underwriting. Now, advanced underwriting is not for everybody, but everyone should be in advanced underwriting. So what do I mean by that? I think it's really good for you to know what the underwriters are doing, have an understanding of what underwriters are doing and why they do it that way. Uh, If you are not a numbers guy, if you don't really have a, you know, a secretly got a crush on, um, you know, Excel spreadsheets and things like that, I highly do not suggest trying to become an underwriter. You can learn it, but it'll be a skill that you will hate using. What you want to do is understand what's the story, how it all works, and et cetera, and then be able to partner with individuals who do like the underwriting. So, you want to show up to advanced underwriting. That happens uh, every other week. On the week that is not happening, we are talking to uh, Mr. Jerry and Cheryl, his wife, 
as they talk to us about the money. You see, what we're doing in this community is we're setting all the pieces that you need, right? On Sunday, you get to hear from, you know, celebrity guest speakers who come in for free, teaching you the game, you know, how they've done the things that they've done and what they're doing differently in this time frame, so that you can be doing the same thing. On Monday, we're reaching out, building relationships. We just disguise it as broker talks and we show you and explain to you how to do the same thing and we support you. We have many of calls that people got on the phone and got stuck talking to the broker. And through the Zoom, we jumped in and we're able to help them and, and say, hey, listen, I'm, I'm Peter's partner. I had a few questions for you if you don't mind. All right. So you get that support of the entire community, all of us that's on there. And then on Wednesdays, you're either talking to a debt broker and learning how the deal that we just Got on Monday, we underwrote it on Tuesday, and now we're talking to a debt broker to be able to show you exactly how the deal can work and how the money flows into it. Uh, or we'll be doing advanced underwriting with Victor and G to show you what happens to a deal when we go levels deep into the underwriting phase. All right, so that's the ecosystem. Glad we shared that, that's important. But not as important as getting to these deals. So let's get this out the way and let us get started. First and foremost, like we always do, I want to make sure that we start. Does anyone have a deal that they are working on and would love to be able to have us underwriting? We'll do the napkin underwriting on that deal for you. If you do, you can either raise your hand or say it in the comments in the chat. Also, is there anyone here that does not have? their napkin. Is there anyone here that came to the meeting and decided not to bring a napkin and would like to be able to get access to the napkin so they can follow along with what we got going on? If so, put it in the chat and, and we'll make sure that you get some. All right, there you go. Janice says she needs one. I got you. Got you, girl. Got you. All hey, right. If anyone, if anyone has any questions outside of uh, what Eddie mentioned, uh, feel free to let us know, drop it in the chat, um, or uh, raise your hand as well. We can help you out. Yep, yep, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, I'm going to put it in the chat for you guys. Anthony, Anthony did you have a question? I think I saw your hand go up. Me, you talking to me? I think I saw Anthony's hand go up. Did you have a question? Oh, uh, no, it came off, came down. You're good, you're good. Oh, cool. Just make sure. Awesome, awesome. All right, uh, Ed, I made you calls, so you have um, ability to share your screen and all that. Let me all get right. this napkin. Uh, one thing I'm... Go, go ahead. Oh, okay, sorry, it was kind of cutting in and out. One thing I want to ask, and I want to see how many people are familiar with this. How many of you guys have come across um, assumable loan properties or deals with an assumable loan? I hope a lot of you, to be honest. But How many people here knows what an assumable loan is? Let's start there. Touché. All right, I'm getting, I'm getting some, some. I have some. I do. Matthew said, just bring it. He don't even care. Like, whatever it is, just bring it. I love it. All right. So if you guys aren't being proactive, uh, well, and let me ask you, should people be asking for if the loan is assumable or not? And who, who do I ask that question to? Sorry, what was the question again? Can you repeat it, please? Yeah, it should people be asking if the loan is assumable or not? And why is that important? And who should I be asking that question to? For everybody else, I just put the link in the chat. So hopefully, and I say this with caution, you, the broker should know if a loan is assumable. Now, will they always? No. So keep that in mind. Now, um, should the seller? Probably. Will they? Not always, obviously, of course, like this is not shocking news to anybody, but essentially what the symbol loan is for uh, um, 
and why it's so important is imagine if I told you you can get a loan at the same interest rate when it was three to three and a half to four percent. What's the biggest factor in the market that makes it so difficult to buy property, especially recently, was the higher interest rate, right? A summable loan essentially is a loan that's already been originated. Like the loan's in place, it existed already, um, might have been three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. Um, you are given the ability and option to, uh, of course, you have to qualify, it doesn't take away from it, but you have the ability to take over the loan. Now, a lot of you might be thinking, how is that different from sub two? There's one massive difference. You then become the loan holder, so you have to qualify for it. A sub two is not the same. You're removing the loan off of the seller's name, and you now hold that. It shows up under your name if you are the person who qualifies, of course. Now, in the multifamily space, to take it a step further, Usually the requirement is, but don't put me on it because obviously there's scenarios where it can change. You would need at least a 10% of the loan liquid and have a total net worth of the loan amount. Now that can be different. Um, and also that could vary based on the loan, but normally that's what I see. Um, someone just mentioned, I would be worried if it's a bridge loan coming due. I'm very happy you mentioned that, Brett. That's one of the things I wanted to go over today and why I asked this question, because I want to show you guys what a loan agreement looks like and what to look for. Um, but that is also a great point. Anytime you're looking at an assumable loan, you have to factor this in. No two loans are ever the same and don't ever assume just because the last loan you looked at is XYZ term that the next one you look at is going to be the same. All right, so it's really important to understand what the terms of a loan are. And I'll definitely show you guys where you can uh, clearly see that and kind of get the whole picture painted for you. Now, is it always gonna be on a loan agreement or you're always gonna get this? Like I said, with everything else, not necessarily. Um, is it the easiest way to identify this stuff? Of course. Um, so if you can get a loan agreement, that's what I would do. Um, or the route I would go. And I will show you guys right now what that looks like. Any questions on that before I jump too far ahead? No, we're good. No, we're good. So let me... All right, so while Ed is doing that, let's make sure that you guys can see. So your screen is, it just says it's sharing. I don't know if you see it actually sharing. You might have to stop it and do it again. Okay, how about now? Yep, now it's working. All right, cool. So this is just the first page. So you'll, very generic. Um, it'll have the owner. Date. This is important because you want to know when it originated. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of pages. Don't get intimidated. And please, please, please don't feel like you have to go through every single one of these right now because I'm going to show you a little trick. You go to page 119. It's almost the same for all of them. Um, and once this jumps, so Usually it's around like the 118, 119 mark um, of the document. And I'll show you guys why you want to go to that page. Did it load? Hold up. Okay, there we go. There we go. All right, cool. 
You guys can see that, right? Um, so we're on page 119. This is the exact screen we want to be on. Um, why this page about the loan when you're underwriting? What that, and I'll go through each one to kind of explain why you need to know it and how it's going to impact the deal. The loan amount is very straightforward. That's the loan amount of the assumable debt. Now, you want to make sure that you make this clear. Actually, here you go. Sorry, 118. This is why we go to 118. You have amortization period, the type, effective date, first payment, pay, first principal and interest payment. You guys may have heard me say a few times that um, knowing when a loan is, if a loan is interest only or if it's principal and interest, this tells you that exact thing. Because if this says the first day of principal and interest payment date is the date of the first payment, then you know, obviously, that the, for the life of the loan, it's a principal and interest payment. But now that I know that this is five years later, I know that the first five years, this is going to be an interest only payment. If you guys don't know the difference, please let me know. I can clarify that. Um, all it means is that for the first five years, you're only paying off the interest. So the in principle, which we saw here, is not changing. Now, why is that important? I'll get to it. Um, obviously, the rate, this is why we like assumable debt. If I told you today you could get a 2.915 interest rate, one, you think I'm lying to you. And two, if I told you I can, you think, who do you know and how did you hit the jackpot? Um, well, I I know what a summable loan is. That's that's the biggest thing. Um, because this could this would be your rate. This will not change for the life of the loan as long as you make sure it's a fixed rate. Okay. Everyone know familiar with the different type of rates. If not, I don't want to go through all of them. Uh Google's a wonderful thing, but there's variable, there's a, it can get very complicated, so I don't want to go into it. Just make sure you know that fixed rate means this isn't changing. Okay. Interest accrual, you can read through that. Um, last interest only payment is kind of what we referred to earlier. Loan term, this is important as well. So, like we remember, it was five years interest only. Now we know that it's five years of principal and interest. So, you want to make sure that when you're underwriting it, you underwrite off of the balance that, of the loan because that is going to affect how you're going to offer it and how much money you need to raise to make up the difference. If the loan amount is 9.847 and the seller is asking for easy number, let's just say double that. So let's say tw uh, 24 arguments sake. You know that you have 50% of the purchase price that you have to come up with. Essentially, it's 50% down, if you think about it. That's when I would combine it with seller carry. So in a hypothetical, just uh, so you guys can kind of get the, paint the picture, I would offer, I'm assuming your loan, seller carry 25%, I come down 25%. That creates 100% of the purchase price. All right, if anyone got lost there as well, just put in the chat and then I'll answer any questions. Um, but the assumable loan is, and when they say how much is it leveraged, what that means is how much, what percentage of the purchase price is the loan? If it's $10 million, they're asking for 20, 50%. Um, and then this is an interesting section as well, the debt service, which you want to know, um, because this is going to tell you how much are you paying per month? And this tells you, okay, what do I underwrite in the first five years? What do I underwrite after that October 2025 date? Because if you don't know when the change is over or if you enter the wrong numbers, this is laying it straight out. You don't, don't make it more complicated than it has to be. And to be honest, when it says the different um, amounts based on the number of days the previous month had, don't make yourself like, don't go crazy trying to figure it out and how you're going to just go with the biggest one. I always just go with the 24,000. 
if I have this scenario, I'm okay. So for one month out of the year, I'm going to worry about how do I underwrite this number? Forget it. Underwrite it at 24717.34. You know, you're never going to be more than that, right? That's the best way I can explain that so that you don't worry about the different potential numbers and outcomes and whatnot. And then this is important. So think about it. October 2025. This becomes your new payment. You are going to increase your monthly mortgage payment by $17,000. That's a lot. Uh, I, I don't care how great a deal is. That's a large chunk for you to uh, have to wake up to one morning if you haven't realized that and take into account how you're going to shift and what your numbers are going to look like when that um, payment comes about. Because let's be honest, if I got a $17,000 check I was already for, or bill I was already for, coming at me every month, it, it's tough. And you and your investors have to be aware of that too. I, I think that's even more important than you understanding it, is are you relaxing your investors? Hey, af after month 60, from when it was originated, of course, our monthly mortgage goes up by 17000 So if you get less money, which you're going to, obviously, overnight you're, you're changing your mortgage, they need to be aware of that. Imagine if you invested in a deal and they didn't tell you that the mortgage jumped up 17000 and all of a sudden you're getting way less than you did for no reason, you're going to be pissed. Like, no way to sugarcoat it. You're going to be like, what the hell just happened? Right? So these are things that you want to be aware of and make sure you relate to your investors and to be honest, your operators, your, your team. Like, they need to be aware of this. Uh, this is this can kill a deal. You you can go underwater real quick, all right? And then you just go into more of the terms about the fees, the replacement reserves. Um, and then obviously, I don't want to go too far into the details of the remaining 133 pages that we didn't go into. But this is going to tell you just the basis of what you need to underwrite. Obviously, there's a lot of factors in regards to prepayment penalty, acquisitions costs, um, and so on and so forth that is not going to pertain to the underwriting yet. But these are the key components of things to know when you're preparing to put an offer in. And I'm going to be honest, if you're doing, if you're not on a team where you have someone that can dive into this and fully understand all the ins and outs, or you have a lender that you can trust that can review this, good luck. I personally would not sit here and go through all 136 pages. I look at the four pages I just pointed out to you, and I'm like, I got the information I need. Whoever knows more about this than I do will handle that. And that's why it's so important to have the right people around you. Luckily, uh, in this community, that's what we're trying to build. Just so you have the resources to put those people around you. Um, so at any point, did I lose anyone? Or is there any questions about the loan agreement and uh, why it's so important to have when going over an assumable loan and um, any other questions in general about that topic? I feel like I went a little fast, so please let me know. I either went too fast and no one understood a damn thing I said, or <laughs> everyone. So Will, well Will has a question. He says, what are the pitfalls of assumable loan? I'm very happy to ask that question. Okay. So now, one of the downfalls, potentially, now this isn't obviously 100% of the time. One of the things you do have to look out for with an assumable loan is the percentage it's leveraged. Now, what that means is, in the example I gave, if I told you the purchase price is 20 million, this loan is for 10 million, where are you finding the other 50%? Like that's a large down payment for anybody. I don't care if it's the best deal you've ever felt like under the sun, you're still coming down 50%. So that is the downfall of an assumable loan um, because a lot of sellers and brokers are going to be like, oh, look, the rate is so great. The terms are amazing. All the X's, the O's, and the you're like, yes, I 100% agree with you. But it's only leveraged 50%. Now, is the seller willing to 
work with me on carrying a portion of that remaining 50%? That's the first question I always ask. If there's ever an assumable loan, the first question you should ask is, what are the loan terms? Do you have a loan agreement? The second is, is this title going to carry the difference between the purchase price and the loan, existing loan? If you don't ask that, one, I, I think you should always ask if seller carries an option, but more so when assumable is involved. And if they say no, under, like they need to understand that, and you should relay this, your purchase price is going to reflect that. Like if I told you, hey, you need 10 million for a $20 million deal, you turn around and tell me, hey, for 10 million, I could go get two $20 million deals. You know what I mean? Like, let's be honest. Uh, you, we got to put it into perspective. Now, I'm not saying don't do that. If the deal is good enough and you have the resources, by all means, do it. But it never hurts to ask. So that's one of the biggest pitfalls of some of the loan. Um, another one could be, and this is why you have to be careful and read the loan docs, is if the turnaround time is too quick. Like, what happens if, so this was 10 years, right? And I think the mature, uh, originated 2020? Yeah. Uh, what if this was five years and it finished in a year and a half or two years even? That's not a lot of time. I mean, you have to get this wrapped up very quick. Like you need to go from, oh, this is really a struggle um, property to stabilize in two years. That's a scary timeline with so much uncertainty of well, well, like the, la the, sca the scope of work, essentially. Yeah. Uh, can, you, can you go back really quick, take it a step back, and can you briefly explain what a bridge loan financing is? And why is it even a topic right now, right? Because a lot of people don't understand what was happening a few years ago, which is the reason why so many people went out and got bridge loans. So I'm going to give the brief um, knowledge of it that I do. But luckily, in this community, we have amazing people who can um, answer that question deeper than I can, uh, which is what our Wednesday calls are with the debt. But essentially, what a bridge loan is, is uh, it's in the name. It's, they give you a loan for a short period of time to bridge you from unstabilized, this property struggling to I'm going to bring it up to the market rents. I'm going to bring this um, property up to its full potential and stabilize it within that time frame so that when you do want to go and refinance, you can get better terms. You can get um, a higher LTV, um, essentially, because you have a more qualified and stabilized property. Um, and in a sense, you're bridging the, the disaster potentially of a uh, property you have right now to the fully stabilized one in three to five years that you'll be able to refinance and the bank will be like, okay, we got you in so, not the most favorable terms, um, but you'll be able to essentially come in, do the work you need, make the improvements, increase the rent, uh, put lipstick on it if you have to, and uh, bring value to it, which is hence the value added. So for, uh, first off, uh, Hector, I appreciate the love, man. Uh, really, really do appreciate the kind words. Um, but so for people who are coming from the single family space, the easiest way for me to help you understand what Ed just said, which I don't even, maybe I don't even need to, because I think he did a great job, is bridge loans is the, multi-family version of hard money lending okay so in a single family space maybe you get a hard money loan and you're not holding the property for years you're holding the property for a couple of months as you fix it up and then you will sell it again refi and etc cetera, etc cetera, right that's the exact same thing but you understand it differently in multi-family there's different tweaks that are done and different wording or whatever but it's literally the same right it's different because you can hold on to this for anywhere from three to five years. Uh, that on average what I've seen. Uh, and then, you know, you bringing the other funding to replace that one. Now, the, the reason why we're having such a big issue now and why what Peter said in the chat about what's going to happen uh, next year, essentially you'll have almost 50%, if not more, of all these multifamily properties are going to be negative 
because of this bridge loan situation, right? Um, when the interest rate changed, you know, like Ed was saying, a property that was cash flowing at one point, all of a sudden now it's no longer cash flowing. And then the, the note is being called due. And you're like, what do, what do we do? Uh, and this is why now is a really good time to get into multifamily. It's a bad time to be in multifamily if you're one of the individuals who got one of these loans, right? But it's a good time to be in multifamily to start learning one and two, buying any of the opportunities that come your way because it will be advantageous. Are you going to get, you know, multifamily 50, 60, 10 on a dollar? No, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about maybe anywhere between 10, 20% discount. We're talking about um, a lot of creative financing to be able to get in on some of these deals, whereas before they would not be interested. So that's the benefit that you guys are able to get and why you must know what bridge loans is. And you should be asking about assumable loans to these brokers and, and making those connections because uh, it helps you with the deals on the right end deals. Now, <clears throat> I will tell you guys this. Uh, we were looking at our database, uh, and, and Ed, I didn't even share this with you. Um, I was just randomly looking this up. You have to get, go through, well, let me ask this. Ed, raise your hand if your camera is on or um, talk in the chat. <clears throat> in the next 12 months, are you open to or who here is focused on buying at least a hundred doors in for multifamily? Raise your hand if you want. All right. 300, 400. I see. <laughs> this, this is actually good. I'm actually interested. Okay, let's let's do this. Over the next 12 to 18 months, put the amount of doors that you want to be able to get in here. Let me see that in the chat. Put the amount of doors that you want to get. Next 12 to 18 months. <clears throat> we have some amazing people in here. Ms. Sherry Miles is in the house. What's going on? Uh, that she's the the wife of the tag team duel uh, when it comes to money. Uh, we spoke about it a little bit earlier, so make sure you guys are following her. Uh, and then we have the the amazing, the great Garcia. Do you know when people have arrived to a certain level, when they no longer have like a first name and a last name, right? It's just like a like Kobe, Jordan, Garcia. That that's the impact you guys see her down here with her amazing picture. Um, she is phenomenal. Uh, I learned a lot from her when it comes to multifamily. Um, we also have the same passion when it comes to affordable housing. So definitely make sure you guys are following her. So. I'm looking at chat. I see 50, 500, 1,000, 150, 800, 500. This is really good. 500, 200. Okay. So with that being said, now let me ask you guys, how many properties that fit your buy box, fit your criteria, all of that? So I'm not talking about how many properties you've seen. I'm saying how many properties that fit fit your buy box in your criteria, um, have you gone through so far? So for example, uh, and this is what I was saying, and I, don't, I haven't shared this with you, for us, we're currently sitting at 42. All right, so Will, Will says 60. Uh, we got five, four, that's good. Who else? About 16 for Matthew. Uh, LP or GP, it doesn't matter. Same thing. Both. Listen, <clears throat> that that I love that John said that. Um, I think that's really good. A lot of people think the only way to make money in, in multifamily is to be a GP. It's the weirdest thing. Uh, LP makes just as much money, sometimes even more, because you can get in on a lot of other deals uh, than just yours. So, uh, Jerry, what's going on, my guy? Quick question. Does everyone know what the difference between LP and GP is? If you don't, please let us know. Well, actually, you know what we should do? Uh, John, are you able to, to talk? You are? Okay, I'm going I'm to have you come up really quick. 
And I'm doing this because I want everybody to fully understand what I mean when I say leveraging the room, right? You've got to be able to do this. So, John, you said you, you, you've you looked through at least 194 properties that fit your buy box, right? Uh, out of those 194, uh, how many of them are you currently in? And what are you in as? Is it as GP or LP? Yeah, sorry. Maybe I didn't understand. Uh, it's 194 doors. Okay, so you have 194 doors that you... Now, are you currently in... LP. Your LP on Limited property. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what is, what is the LP? <clears throat> it's a limited partner where all you are is a passive investor. Uh, you have no voting rights. You have, um, uh, you know, n no obligation to the property. Um, so you're just, uh, it's just investments. Uh, it's it's kind of like investing in the stock market, except for it's a lot better because you have, um, you have real estate back in it. Right. Um, so my stock, my stock portfolio is down over 20% last year. So, uh, that's not good. Uh, yeah. All my real estate. Yeah. I'd say my real estate's up at least 18%. Um, and, uh, so wow. stocks are going, uh, yeah, they're going the wrong direction. And, uh, so they'll be selling soon. soon, soon hopefully it'll go up enough so I can sell it and buy some more real estate. Right. There you go. I have a question for you that I want you to kind of paint a picture for us. And I don't want you to use your personal LP, um, example, cause those are your numbers. It's your investment. I don't want you to go into personal details. But one thing I do want to kind of paint the picture for, because you are the person that everyone looking to raise capital is pitching to. You you were that person, like you were in that seat, right? Someone came, pitched to you, said, here's a great deal, and you put your money into it, which is the, who everyone here is going to be talking to that tries to raise capital. What made you invest in the deal that you ended up investing in? And what have you learned since uh, becoming an LP? Sure. So, I mean, that's a really great question. Um, so I wanted to learn more about being in multifamily. So that's really why I invested as LP. I wanted to be in a deal. Uh, so I'm, and I'm in a deal with Pace. So, you know, Pace is my mentor and he's a phenomenal mentor, obviously, um, to all of us all. And so I felt a good obligation to uh, invest in his deal. And uh, so I'm looking for more education myself um but the people that i talk to about being in you know lp position they more or less just want a good return you know and and then have a good um have the um security of it being in real estate their investment in real estate rather than stock market um so i saw somebody said something about um lp being more than 10 percent um the 10 you know uh, I think most LP investments are going to, um, at the end of the term, whether it's a three or five year deal, they absolutely it's going to be more than ten percent. Um, but on a a, a yearly basis, um, until the the asset is either refinanced or sold, it, it'll be a smaller percentage. Um, but you're still getting you're still getting passive income. You're still getting mailbox money um, uh, while your money's you know also while your while your money's also growing, um, you know. Um, it's it's growing the whole time because of the appreciation and then you also get depreciation uh, on your um, income so like if uh, in this particular situation the depreciation almost is is, is important to me as uh, as the appreciation or the you know the um, quarterly you know um, income that you get from it and depreciation is kind of you know everybody's different because it depends on where you are in taxes and, and how you uh, file. And I, I think everyone's on this call now thinking I signed, came from a napkin underwriting call and here we are talking about <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. But look, guys, I, I know uh, we're getting a little off top, very off topic at this point. But one thing that I want to point out that John mentioned, it's like he invested in the person. The building, they're trusting that you know what you're doing. That's why we hold all this stuff. That's why we have uh, a debt call every two weeks. We have underwriting. We have... Um, that Sunday we hear amazing people who are in the game and how they built their portfolio because the investor is going to look at you and say, Hey, I'm trusting you that you did your homework on the property. And that's why we host these every week. So you can sharpen your tool, um, your tools and you can get better at it and meet other people who are going to build this up. And one thing that's really important 
that um, I, I don't think is talked enough about is making sure you have an or the right operator. And what that means is, sure, on paper, I think this is a great deal, but who's executing it, right? And as John mentioned, I didn't even know you invested with Pace. Like, I didn't know who you're, who you're invested with. Obviously, we know who that is. And obviously, we know that, hey, if you're going to put your money with someone, that's a good person to, right? Yeah. And test it. So, so John, um, definitely thank you for coming up. Last question I have for you. Um, has, has any of the other like, GPs, do you find that they like poke fun at you and tease you because you're an LP? Is there like beef like that happening or like, does it, does, does that not matter? That's uh yeah, that's a funny question because um, I think we all want to be GPs and, and I mean, I do a hundred percent. I want to be a GP uh, on a, a property soon. And um, just, I just, I'm so interested in it. So, uh, but yeah, yeah. You kind of get, you got that feeling a little bit, you know, oh, you're LP, but to your point, Eddie, I mean, you know, um, I, you know, I have another W2, I have a W2, so I have to kind of focus on that right now. Um, so, uh, you know, if I was in a GP position, I might have to bow, bow out of that uh, W2, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so, but yeah, yeah. I mean, GPs, yeah. The GPs are supposed to be the, 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 the studs and the stud edge, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Supposed to, supposed to. <laughs> yeah. Supposed to. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I, I appreciate you, man. Thanks for, for, for uh, coming up and speaking on that. And, and one of the reasons why I brought that up is because, you know, as you guys develop more and more into this, right. Um, it's about learning where exactly do you fit in? Right. Some people may be here tonight saying, Oh, I can't wait to be my own operator. I can't wait to be a GP only to realize LP is your sweet spot, right? Like that's really what you want to do. Um, being a GP is a lot of work, but it has a lot of rewards. Uh, being an operator has a lot of work, but it has a lot of rewards. But you have to feel which one works best for you. And to Ed's point earlier, when he talked about a team, right? This is why it's so important to network and connect with each other so that you can build a team and you can kind of figure out where you would like to be in that team and just do that right move forward with that so that you are happy in what you're doing right I, ed knows this all the time i talk about like the number worst the number one worst thing that you could do is get in a deal that 12 months from now 18 months from now when when you're used to thousands of dollars coming to your bank account every month so now it's not a big deal right it's like oh yeah whatever you know yeah oh i forgot today was the first I just made 5000 for my investment 18 months ago. Oh, I forgot, right? When you get to that stage, if that wasn't a deal that you actually love and wanted to stay in it and wanted to do the work that's required of you when you were willing to say, I'll do it when you were broke or you weren't making that money, if that wasn't the case, 12 to 18 months, that money will be coming in and you will hate the fact that you're in this deal. So I bring all this up to be able to tell you guys, like, listen, this is how this thing comes back full circle. When you are doing your napkin underwrite deals, I don't, I shouldn't hear anyone complain about a, about how many underwriting they have done until they've gotten to what at least a hundred. Ed, would you say that? Like a hundred deals that you know work for you, and you have to kind of turn away, right? I've probably done a hundred in a month. So take your time as you progress through this. Understand you are on the right course, but people are going to get discouraged. And we want to make sure that we're just helping you with the proper expectations to be able to do what's necessary um, towards your goals, right? Uh, and and that's, that's what's important. And my last question on the LPGP thing, and I want to see how many people, uh, I want as many people that can answer this to please do in the chat. Which side, LP or GP, do you think gets more equity on the deal? Which side do you think gets more equity on the deal, LP or GP? Oh, I love that there's different answers. Yes. Exactly so what I'm we, we get in We get in a mix. I see depends on how the deal is structured. Of course. That's yeah. a... That's a 
That's a good one. That's kind of cheating, though. That that answer is like when you go to the Apollo and, you know, you're going to sing a song and they sing like a gospel song. You're like, well, they suck, but I can't really boo them because I feel like I'm booing Jesus, right? That, I feel like that's what that answer was right there. But I still, I still appreciate it. Uh, sure. LPs put up most of the capital so they get most of the equity the way I see it. Okay, we 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 got we got a mixed batch here. Yeah. Okay. So for anyone who dreaming of being the GP is because they're gonna own most of the equity. No, not even close. Uh, Ryan's right. Seventy thirty is probably the best case scenario for the GP being the thirty. Depending, obviously, I'm going back to the depends idea with the deal of how much of the deal, uh, essentially the capital needs to be raised. If it's like a 20% down payment, sure. If it's a 50% or 40% raise, that's a different story, right? But usually I see 70, 30, 80, 20, but the LP side gets all of the majority of the equity, right? Um, here's another fun fact about the GP side of things. You can't be a GP if you are not involved in the deal. What I mean by that is, let's say Eddie and I are doing a deal and it's just us two. If Eddie says, hey, I'm going to bring you all the money, I'll raise all the capital for you, and then I don't want to do anything, you're not a GP at that point. You have to have an active role in the deal in order to be a GP because you're a general partner. That's what it means. So, for example, let's say Eddie's like, hey, I'm going to bring you all the investors. I'm going to have all the capital, capital raised. And you might be asking, what else can I do? Well, very simple. These, you want to keep relations with these investors. They're Eddie, Eddie brought the investors. He's going to know them better than I am, right? So being an investor relations is a part of your capital raise. And that is a GP task. Exactly, investor relations. So... I want you guys to think of it like this. When we say there's a lot of parts to this machine and operations that is a multifamily business, we're not kidding. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that we don't talk about because we are not even there yet in the process um, that we haven't scratched the surface. So I just want to make that clear as well. Uh, the GP puts in the sweat equity. LP puts in capital equity. Now you could do both if we really want to make it complicated. But let's just leave it at that for now. <laughs> Any questions? I know we went on a massive tangent, but um, I feel like this is stuff that's as important as the underwriting, because if you don't know this stuff, you don't know what you're underwriting. You want to know what your team's return is. You want to know who you're paying what and uh, whatnot. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it open for any questions. All right, perfect. Love that. While, while we're doing that, let's go ahead and pull up uh, one of our first that we'll do. And knock that out. Uh, and 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 just so that we're clear, guys, like <clears throat> once you start learning napkin underwriting, it is exciting, right? And if we do several different deals, it's exciting. But you know, tonight we wanted to do a little bit something different so that you can get the mind frame behind the underwriting, right? So you can get a better understanding of what things you should be looking out for and why and what does that mean to the grand scheme of things. Because without it, uh, you'll just be underwriting deals and it's going to get worse and worse, right? You're, you're going to be underwriting deals that just don't pencil out because you don't know the important details. They're small, but important details that can make or break a deal. So that's how that works. And what, what type of deal we're going to be underwriting today? Um, so I do have an OM pulled up, which is the offering memorandum. Let me see. My computer hates me. All right. Oh, this one has an assumable loan. I didn't realize that. Cool. And then I also found out more stuff today that I was uh, playing around with about loans regarding uh, the different way to factor the rate. Definitely not going to get into that, but remember, you are going to get quoted a lot of different things um, and crazy lingo, and you might not even understand what the rate is. Like, how you tell me what the rate is without giving me a number? You think it's like, Oh, they just tell me a number and I know what the rate is. No, it that, that doesn't happen. So be aware that with any with the assumable debt or any debt in general, 
uh, there's a lot of layers and components to it, which is also why we hold the debt call. So make sure you guys are on that, um, because that, obviously that's going to be a much better explanation than I will give you guys um, on that topic. Now, as you guys know, I'm in Los Angeles, California, so I love picking properties in my backyard because I know no one's in this call is crazy enough to buy it. So I'm like, all right, no one's going to worry about the deal uh, because we're not going to have to worry about anyone trying to buy it. And if you are a multi licensed realtor, give me a call. <laughs> so I'm indirectly doing my own marketing as well. Um, so let me just pull this up. Probably should have done this before. All right. So the key things you want to know about a property before you um, dive into the napkin, um, obviously, is what's the strategy with the sale and what is the reason they're selling. Um, if you're going to buy, what are you going to? What's the upside? What's the potential? Um, and why is the seller selling? Uh, it's always a big one. I like it on an OM when they give a little bit of a breakdown about the property and what they've recently done. Um, and obviously if you know your area and market, you shouldn't have to worry about too much of the um, area overview, which people love, or brokers love to put into the OMs. Um, but obviously it's good to check it out. Um, if anyone has any questions on the way, please let us know. Um, so we'll just jump into this real quick. So we have our price nice and organized up front here. Cool. So let's not be crazy. This is LA. We don't get 7% on anything. Um, pro forma cap rate. So cap rate, there you have it at 4.29. Ask price is 9950 number of units 45 cap x we will go throughout the om and hopefully we'll find it there and then the financing let me see we'll go over that as well I'm gonna put this in the OM or in the current mortgage section for a smoothable loan. So this is 5.5. Term is five years. It doesn't see the amortization. Monthly mortgage, 3507.3. Now, here, when it says interest only, if you're not sure um, if it's interest only or if it's principal and interest, if you have the monthly mortgage and, of course, the loan amount, that's fine. Like, we can figure that out. I need one of these two. Interest only, yes or no, or the payment amount. Because if I have the rate and the loan amount, I can figure out if it's interest only or principal and interest. Uh, very simple to figure out. So don't worry about it too much if you're like, oh, I don't know. Um, as long as you have the mortgage payment or it says on the OM or whatever document you're looking at, uh, then we'll be good to go. Actually, real quick, close this times this. So, assuming I did this correctly, which I think I did, this is principal and interest. So interest only payments, no. So 
So sometimes they have the rent roll and the T12. Well, usually the rent roll. Sometimes they have the rent roll in the OM, which makes it convenient, but also not necessarily always up to date. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, but what you want to do is you just want to see what the monthly um, rent is. And they also give you the pro forma, which makes this one really easy. So we know that it's 45 units. So what we're going to do here is this equals 66, 66, 5 divided by 45. And then we're going to do 85580 divided by 45. And now we have our two rents. And yes, that's the rent in LA for probably a very small space. Yep, that those are, these are studios and one bedrooms. So welcome to LA. <clears throat> So this is 1481 and pro forma is 1901. Now, a lot of people ask like, oh, CapEx, rehab, how do I find that out? How do I know if the number they gave me is high or low? One way to look at it, and um, this is just to know for general knowledge and also to know for um, does what they're saying actually make sense. When you look at the per average rent, and then you look at the pro forma market rents, you see that's a really large gap. $500 a month is not a joke um, in regards to the in, to rent per unit. So what you wanna think about as well is when um, you're being quoted a CapEx budget, it's like, okay, does that amount that they're saying your CapEx budget is going to be justify the difference in rent? If you told me this project or this difference is only going to cost me hundred thousand, I think you're crazy. I'm just be upfront. Like, there's no way you're increasing the rent to five hundred dollars off a hundred thousand dollar rehab, unless they're just it's in good condition. They just suck at management. Now that's a different story. You should know that. They should say, "Hey, management sucks. Operator sucks. Guy's been self managing it for twenty years and is has so much money, doesn't know what to do with it. They don't want to increase rents. They feel bad. That's a different conversation." But if it's like, hey, the property is in shaky condition, okay, cool. So I know there's a rehab needs to be done. They're like, yeah, it's going to cost you 2000 a unit. But I'm increasing the rent to 500 a month. Something's not adding up. Like, the, like you're sitting on a gold mine and you're just going to sell it to me? Like, okay, well, what's the catch, you know? Um, and obviously, you, you realize that and you'll see all that when you do a full inspection. But we want to have an idea before we get there. We don't want to be hundreds of thousands of dollars off because you're going back to the negotiation table. Um, you're losing time. You're losing money with an inspection. If it's out of state, you're flying there, your state, all this stuff adds up. So you want to be able to identify and uh, factor all these things in before you get too far into the deal and you have to invest more time and money. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, it, it's just kind of like a simple thing you can look at and like, all right, does this really make sense? Like, if it's that easy to do, why don't they just keep it? Um, if you're asking them, they don't have a good enough answer, massive red shot. I agree, 100%. Uh, that's one of the first things I would be worried about. Um, unit mix, important to know. Um, obviously, you don't want too many one in ones in studios. You, I prefer having a very good mix of one in ones and Two and ones doesn't have to be two and two like in this case. Um, this is not an ideal unit mix for the number of units it is, um, but that just is what it is. Also, if you realize um, the current rents right here, and I just did the math for no reason, but that's okay. Um, and here's a little bit of the or the breakdown of the income of potential rent, laundry income, gross potential, um, expenses, and your NOI. This is the debt service that they calculate with the loan they had mentioned earlier. And then this is your cash flow after. Okay. So just get familiar with this and understand like, okay, what am I looking for? What does this all mean? Um, and this is what is very important that you want to look at, which is expenses. I personally would, don't like underwriting it at what their pro forma is. I would underwrite it at what their current is. Are you 
shooting higher than you should, or it, in reality, it will be 100%. Yes. But now what if I told you after all your underwriting, it's actually 10% better than what you underwrote and you just made yourself 10% more by being cautious? You're, I'm pretty sure you're going to be happy. And if let's be honest, if this 10% is the reason the deal doesn't work, you shouldn't be buying into it anyway. That's my philosophy. Because if you look at this, this is a $6,000 difference. If that's the reason the deal didn't work, this deal has more red flags than, or it's too tight anyway. Like you've given yourself no buffer. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. I, I mentioned this a lot. So anyone here for the first time, I will over on the right. I guess is how I should put it, um, and be safe, then um, make everything like best case scenario. And if something goes wrong, you're underwater and that's not fun. You definitely don't want to be in that position um, because you never know. The people who got bridge loans, like we we're talking about earlier, three years ago, five years ago, they think they'd be in the position they're in now. They could have bought the best deal in the world. And now they're looking like, oh my God, we're screwed. So be careful with that stuff on underwriting for sure. And then you also want to know what their expenses are. Uh, management, utilities, pool service, which is good to know, repair maintenance, how much are they spending, landscaping, how much are they spending, and then on-site manager. Uh, insurance and taxes, you really can't change. It is what it is. Also be cautious. That th because this is a great example actually. If they're telling you their current tax and insurance is this amount, and they're telling you you're gonna pay the same amount when you purchase it, they're lying to you. It's hundred percent gonna go up. Like not by hundred percent, maybe by three hundred percent. Um, and I've I've talked to a few people and they've told me like, whatever quote you get, whatever quote a broker tells you, or whatever they were paying triple it. That's how crazy insurance is in some places now. Um, and taxes in any prettier. So be cautious of that where you're not just using the number they give you because that can really throw off your numbers. Um, and this is market stuff that's any comparables, similar stuff that's sold in the area, what the rents are. Um, but we don't have a CapEx rehab budget, unfortunately. But luckily, because you're such good friends with the broker who brought you this deal, you could ask them. And that's kind of what I would do. So just for argument's sake, um, I'll put in a number here. Uh, let's say 7,500. All right. And then from there, you've basically gotten all the meat of the information you need. With current rent, average rents, CapEx, number of units, uh, expenses, occupancy, asking price, the cap rate, and uh, rate for the class building, and we know the loan. Uh, the amortization is important, but given that you have a monthly mortgage, like I mentioned, um, we can navigate that. So surprisingly, this one actually comes pretty close in the valuation, um, which I probably wasn't expecting. Um, but this is essentially a quick run through of napkin underwriting. Now, am I going to be sending an LOI off of this? No. Am I going to be um, going to deeper dive, like verifying their market rents? Absolutely. Am I going to want to know what their rehab budget is before I send an LOI? Absolutely. Um, and I'd want to dive more into knowing what the mortgage situation is and how that affects my numbers. And you guys have to factor this in as well. As much as the value of the property is important, it's as important knowing what you, the buyer, um, and your team essentially are looking for in an investment because we can both be looking at the same property and we can have different buy criteria. And for me, it might be a terrible deal, but you might be the best deal you've seen in a long time because your focus and your resources are different than mine. Okay? So... The napkin underwriting isn't made to make your decision for you. Napkin underwriting is here for you to see if you should pursue this any more than you have to. Because one thing we are trying to do is uh, 
through this community is one, make sure you're using your time as efficiently as possible, but also like, hey, these are all resources that we use. And we, like, I use this. I also have my other calculator that uh, I use that I got through my mentorships that I I just used so many times. I've gotten so comfortable doing it. I kind of, I could skip this step because I just like my calculator and I use that more, but my team uses this every day. You know, Eddie's like, hey, I got something, napkin underwriting's done, sends it over and I take a look at it and we make a decision very quickly. I can get an LOI out in 20 minutes. That LOI will have three offers. If the broker's available, we could get on a call and see if we're going to take this deal down fairly quickly, you know? Now, does that mean I'm done underwriting? Absolutely not. I just need to know I can get to the LOI stage to see if one, the seller series, and two, to make sure that, hey, we didn't miss the mark because we took too long. We didn't miss the call for offers. We showed how serious we are by being aggressive and being quick. And now all of a sudden the broker's like, oh, these guys are serious. You know, that they will send me something and we'll move quick to get a response. Um, and we get a lot more feedback because of that. Um, and of course, here's the beautiful part about real estate. When you open escrow or you're in contract, you, you have all the leverage. You're not forced to buy anything that doesn't check out for you once you've done all your due diligence. One of the mentor, uh, my mentor says in the calls we have every week, this is their operations guide. When they open escrow on a uh, property that they're looking to purchase, his job is to find every reason not to do this deal. Kill the deal as many times as possible. Um, every little crack, flaw, hole in the operate equation, you try to say, nope, we're not doing it because of this. If it passes every single one of those tests and you get to the signing table, then you have exhausted all your options. And so why, all right, we have no reason not to do this. And that's the type of deal you want to buy. Don't buy it emotionally. Don't because you're an expert for the first time and it's exciting or you're like, oh my God, I, this is everything I want in the location and the size and I'm going to own 300 units. No, because like Eddie mentioned earlier, it's very easy to look three years later and be like, oh my God, what do we do? So any questions on the underwriting, the process? I know that's a little quick, but we had such a good conversation beforehand and uh, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So um, that was kind of just like a run through of how that looks. And um, yeah, we're good for questions if anyone has any. Uh, Eddie, you're on mute. There you go. Um, I think that's really good, right? And if and if it was a good deal, you would submit it. Um, you would hit that link, put the information in, take a screenshot of the napkin, and then within 24 to 48 hours, somebody from the team would be hitting you back saying, hey, let's set up a scheduled time where we can do a Zoom call so I can walk you through the napkin, walk you through the elevated underwriting, and here's what to do next. Here's the next steps. Here's what you should be saying to the broker, or here's what I would say, or Here's the LOI, send this over. Like, uh, and then you kind of continue to progress to get the deal done, if it's a good deal or not, right? So uh, sounds like a uh, hot meal. Okay, yeah, yeah. I was about to say, what is what is hot? Um, from uh, Robert G. Allen, amazing book, by the way. Thank you. Jennifer asks, what is the difference between performa cap rate and the market cap rate? So the pro, uh, pro forma cap rate and market cap rate. Well, when you are purchasing the property, you're buying it at X cap rate. Okay. So whatever the cap rate is off of their price. Now, when you are turning around and you've stabilized the property, the cap rate is going to be different because you're at a higher NOI, hopefully. I really hope so, actually. Because if you did a direct correlation with the percentage, you're the, it, I mean, the best thing I can compare it to is if I tell you a 500 square foot house is being rented at $2 a square foot, that equals a thousand. Now, if I told you a $2,000 or 2,000 square foot house is being rented at $2 a square foot, that's 4,000. Just because, so when the number is higher, it doesn't correlate the same way. You know, we're not using the same reference point. So the cap rate when your NOI is higher 
is going to be affected by that uh, increased number because you can't use the same cap rate if the NOI is lower. It's just, your number is going to be way too high. I'm pretty sure I confused you guys there, but um, essentially your pro form, your market cap rate is what your stabilized cap rate is. And that's where you want to talk to lenders and make sure when you are doing your underwriting and you're connecting with the different people you have in regards to your resources that you ask them what the cap rate that they are underwriting their deals at because the lenders are underwriting the same way you do okay uh -huh. why that's important is if you know what your noi is going to be in five years which you can project out you could then use the cap rate they give you um to find out the value we have another question. How do you determine your cap uh, cap X is within the parameter for a good deal? Is it based on the performer value? So with cap X, see the cap X could be very high or could be very low on a deal. It just depends what is the return on the cap X. So if you have, for example, like I was mentioning earlier, if you have a $500 gap from current rents to market rents, the CapEx has to justify that. If you told me it's going to cost me $3 million to do that, I'm not doing it. Not on 45 units, which is not enough return. But if it's 500000 or a million, you're like, okay, maybe that makes sense now. So the CapEx does depend on what the return is to get those market rents up. And then obviously that factors into your purchase price. So the CapEx isn't necessarily where I would um, look at for the value in regards to like whether it's a good deal or not. You structure the deal around what the CapEx is. Because the thing is with the CapEx, especially when it's um, focusing on the interior rehab, you can't really change that number. Like if you're cutting corners, you're trying to um, save money on that end, you're just going to hurt yourself. Like the square footage is the square footage. The amount of work is the amount of work. Can you save money on it? 100%. And, but that should be the cherry on top. Um, I would never say, like Eddie comes to me and says, hey, the CapEx budget on this property is 500000 I'm like, cool, I'm going to underwrite it at four hundred. dollars uh, That's just not going to work. You know? So you want to structure your deal around the CapEx and not let the CapEx um, be where you cut corners. You, 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 it's not going to end well. If anything, I over budget, to be honest. Um, so the deal really comes with what does the end product look like and what does it take to get there? Awesome. 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 Okay. So with that being said, everybody, um, we have five minutes left. We want to do a hard stop at 930. Again, like that point, we respect for everybody's time. But I do want to make sure we're not missing any questions or anything like that. So if you have something that we went over that was just too much or I might, you might have sneezed and you missed it, right? Uh, definitely let us know what that is. If not, show some love and appreciation in the chat. Give some love to my guy, Ed, coming in. As always, giving up the game for the free ski. Uh, and we definitely appreciate it. And also make sure if you have not put your information in the chat, uh, put your info in so people can reach out to you, connect with you. We love doing this. We love being able to build uh, a location for, <clears throat> for um, you know, a community of individuals who are focused and in the same thought process in mind and want to be able to continue to do this and give games. So really appreciate it. Uh, you guys showing love. Uh, before we do go, I uh, see my guy Jerry is still with us and I appreciate that. Uh, Jay, are you able to speak on a mic or no? There he is. Can you unmute yourself, my guy? Hey, what's up? There's a tag team duel. How are you? Hey. I uh, wanted to um, make sure everybody got a chance to see you guys. Are you are you guys on tomorrow, right? Yeah, yeah. we're on tomorrow. And okay, uh, we, we've been talking about it. I would hate for you to be like, no, it's an off night, and I'll have to make up something for everybody to go to. So yeah. glad, glad that that's happening. Uh, for those who might have came in late after Ed and I spoke about exactly what's taking place, uh, tell us a little bit about why tomorrow night is probably, in my opinion, one of the best uh, of the week. 
to just talk about money, but what, what do you guys say? Yeah, well, we, we uh, do a, a bi-weekly uh, call. We talk about the current debt market. We spend about 15 minutes on the current debt market, where rates are. Um, you know, we're, we're talking, we're brokers, so we're talking to different lending sources all the time. Um, you know, and we're, we know which lenders are currently actively looking to lend and we know which ones are kind of pulling back because of the market and are getting scared. And um, and we, we talk about the reasons and and just just all the complexities of, of the different products that we offer. Um, and then tomorrow night, uh, you know, we usually have one main topic that we talk about. Um, but tomorrow night we just came back from uh, Growth Con in Las Vegas. And so we're going to be talking about growth con and uh, the speakers and, and kind of our takeaways, my wife and me and my two boys went, got to go to growth con. And uh, so we'll each take a few minutes and just kind of tell, tell what we liked about it and, uh, and who our favorite speaker was and, and that kind of thing. So. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm excited. Definitely can't wait to be able to pull up and, and enjoy and share the moment with you guys. It's going to be great. Uh, if you guys, weren't making the effort to attend, now you know what you've been missing, right? Definitely want to show up to it. How do you attend? It's very simple. The easiest and fastest way to be able to do it is to go to the Facebook group, Multifamily Freedom Chasers. You can jump in in the ecosystem there. You'll be able to see the link there as well. And also make sure you're following us all on social media. We always post when we're doing something and making sure that everybody can get in the loop. But the easiest way to make sure that you are part of the system, because you do get an email, you do get a text message to kind of help remind you. Now, we try our best not to bombard you. So you might get one or two, something like that, only during the time a meeting is supposed to take place. Uh, but we want to make sure we're giving you guys exactly what you need to not just win, but for all of us to win collectively, right? All of us to win together as a group. So with that being said, Miles family, appreciate you. Love you. See you tomorrow. Yeah. For sure. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Yes, yes. Ed, do you have anything you want to add for the people before you dip off? Nope. Have a good night, guys. Uh, take all care. Right. That's my guy, Ed. And I am Eddie Charger. Thank you guys for joining us. Multifamily Freedom Chasers. Another great night where we underwrote deals, talked about multifamily, and got one step closer to helping you accomplish your goal, owning multifamily, and never looking back from then on out. So with that being said, everybody, I love you. Stay charged up.